So my topic, as you see, I think it would take about four or five hours to really do any justice to, or perhaps a seminar. Actually, I, I proposed a seminar on this topic as a course. But I'll, I'll, I'll speak to you with what I, what I have. I want to say that I know that from what I'm seeing at this conference, you're all working with sources. You're all working with specific sources on specific problems. And my talk will be more reflective about sources and also about the, the link, the connection between sources and the actual events, how the actual events produce different kinds of sources depending on the events. And I've chosen two moments of uh, mass killing, uh, two genocides, if you will, uh, the Holodomor, the famine of 1932-33, and the Holocaust. And this is a conference on the Holocaust, but by, comparison, by making comparisons with the famine, I think you'll see, you'll see things about the sources. It's my hope, anyways. Anyways, I, th I, I, I think it's an, I, an interesting idea. So I would start with testimonies and memoirs. Uh, one of the striking facts is the difference in the kind of way these sources were collected. So if you look at the famine sources, the sources for the famine, very few memories, very few memoirs or testimonies came from the period of the Nazi occupation. But there are a few. I ran across one published one in a journal. A student of mine says that he found a few in Krakowski Visti. But basically during the war, uh, uh, you could not write in detail about the, about the famine because the Germans themselves were doing a famine, so they, had, they, they didn't want people writing about it. Then the next time we get any kind of uh, information on the famine and memoirs is a contest of memoirs on 20th century Ukrainian history that was organized by the Osaredok Ukrainian Cultural and Education Center in Winnipeg, in Canada, 1947. And that produced about a dozen uh, testimonies of, of personal experiences of the family. Then, the next time I could find a major source of uh, famine testimonies was in a book published in 1953 called Black Deeds of the Kremlin, a white book, uh, in which 27 testimonies of the famine were published. That's already 20 years after the famine. At this time, 20 years after the famine, there were maybe, maybe 50 memoirs of the famine. And, the, and it did not, we did not get any kind of serious collecting of people's memories until the uh, middle, middle of the 1980s, uh, when the Uni United States government set up the Commission on the Ukraine Famine uh, and published three volumes of testimonies, entirely collected in the diaspora in 1987, 1988, by two uh, Two scholars, uh, James Mace, who then moved to Ukraine later. He's a very good friend of mine. We went to school together. He helped me uh, uh, in my public speaking. He was a good public speaker. And we, we together were members of the Brastvot Verezosti Moralnosti, which we founded at Harvard University when we were working there. Uh, and Leonid Le Le Harris also, uh, also, uh, 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 collected these memoirs entirely in the diaspora. Then, around the same time in the late 1980s, uh, Stanislav Kulczycki, who, 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 was a, who at first had denied the famine, or that it was just mistakes, um, but he initiated an oral history project in 1989. 
He published a questionnaire for it in Siski Visti. Uh, and among other things, it asked about relief efforts undertaken by the authorities. Because this was a transitional period, 1989. The Soviet Union still existed. The Communist Party still existed. But it was deep perestroika. So, but he asked the question, how did the local authorities help? What were the relief efforts? Which this question disappeared in all later, all later contexts. Uh, he received 6,000 responses. And, and the project was then taken over by the writer Volodymyr Maniak. He and his wife, who is also a writer, selected and edited, essentially rewrote, about 1,000 replies. They later died in an auto accident. And the published responses are available, but 5,000 of these are lost, and we don't know where they are. And then, for the 75th anniversary of the famine, uh, President Yushchenko, in his campaign to have the recognition of the famine, collected 210,000 testimonies. But this was already, 2008 was the 75th anniversary of the famine, so whose testimony was he collecting? So that's the first, first point I'm going to make. The Holocaust, totally different. Uh, about 7,200 uh, testimonies were collected mainly right after the war by uh, the Central Jewish Historical Commission. These are housed in Warsaw, but if anybody really needs it, I have them all on, uh, on, a, on a flashka, you know, and, and uh, I've given them out to people who, who need them to study, to, to study these issues. Then there's the Fortunov Video Archive, and this is only the highlights. The Fortunov Video Archive at Yale University, uh, initiated in 1979, has, has about 4,500 testimonies. Uh, then there's the Spielberg Project, the USC Shaw Foundation, with 55,000 interviews from 1994 to 1999, including many in Ukraine. Uh, then there's the Yahad in Unum, Father Patrick Debois, videotaping interviews in Ukraine since 2006. There are problems with, with, with various ones of these, but I just, at the moment I want to just go over them. And in addition to all that, there are many printed, privately printed memoirs of the Holocaust in Ukraine. So, and here's sort of, this is from the, these are the, some, some uh, the, the famine ones. Um, you can see that they become a sort of sacral text. This is in the Holodomor Museum in Kiev. There are all these books, these black books contain documents, uh, and uh, memoirs and and and, Svichinya. and here they are in this kind of almost um, religious uh, uh, place, and and they are the scripture to it. And here's what they're like. I mean, you you, you probably have seen these kind of things. They 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 they, they, they they're almost all uh, all very similar in many ways. Um, what happens? Um, uh, the idea that the, co the collection of the bodies, uh, uh, that so many people were dying, um, and um, what they had to eat or didn't have to eat, eating of the weeds, killing of their pets, uh, fears about cannibalism, uh, and uh, this was collected in 1998, so 55 years after the events uh, described. Uh, one of the characteristics of, the, of these memoirs, as opposed to the, uh, the later ones, the Yushchenko ones, is they often emphasize the division within the villages, because although Although 
it's often thought that the famine was Red Army personnel, Russians coming and imposing the famine on the villages. Very often villages were divided and some people, some people collaborated with the Soviet authorities. And, and here you have an example of you know, it's almost the same as, 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 as you read in some Holocaust testimonies. Um, so and, and, and that, I would say, is a typical example of a, of a, of a, of a, of a relatively solid and, and believable Hol uh, Holodomor famine memoir. And then, as I say, the, um, the ones collected by, by the... Uh, Zidovsky uh, Institut Historyczny, or the Central Jewish Historical Commission, r right after the war, um, they they are available. They are available. They are uh, all in Polish. Not all in Polish. They're about, I would say, slightly more than half are in Polish, and slightly less than half in Yiddish, and occasionally some in German, occasionally some in other uh, uh, languages. And uh, I, I, I did uh, an article, which I don't know if you, if you ever seen it, uh, where I take one of the, one of these uh, uh, testimonies by, by a certain uh, Ruzsa Wagner, and, um, and I compare it to photographs. She describes her testimony, and then I take the photographs and I compare them. And what I, what I show from this, I think, clearly, is that you can believe the memoirs when they talk about what they personally experienced. It gives a good idea of what people experienced, but it doesn't say much about perpetrators or details, uh, but, but it gives the experience people had. So now I want to, that's just a, give a general idea of the kind of sources I'm talking about. And that's what I would say is the main thing one should get from uh, testimonies, is personal experiences. Often there are errors in numbers, dates, details of all kinds. I once took the murder of Jews in Kwasil and looked at different testimonies, and they would each describe it differently. Uh, how many Jews were being, they, whether they were on a plank above a pit, and if so, how many people were on it, or whether they were in the pit, these things would, 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 would change according to everybody's remembrance. Don't forget, people are remembering traumatic events. It's very hard for them to, 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 to see them in, 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 in the exact detail. So there's often those errors. But they will know if their brother was murdered. They will know if they were attacked. They will know if they had to hide. You know, so people's experiences come out of it. Jan Gross has very important insights into the value of testimonies. Uh, he's often criticized for it. People say, well, Jan Gross says you have to believe everything they say in survivor testimonies. That's not what he says. What he says is very often, he says, very often, we will make fewer mistakes if we believe a testimony than if we don't. Because, and I'll come to that when we come to documents, perpetrators, perpetrators are interested in certain things and not in other things. Just like victims are interested in certain things and not in other things. And um, uh, perpetrators are not necessarily always interested, depends on the situation, but not necessarily interested in, their, in, in uh, uh, writing down their crimes. But um, uh, uh, therefore, and, and if it's a secret murder for some reason, then the testimonies are important to take seriously. Uh, uh, he showed that in the case of Yedvabna. But I also came across a case like that, which I think is very similar, which is the murder of Jews uh, in, by Army North of Upa in the winter of 43-44. These were murders that occurred in the woods, 
uh, in the forest where Jews were hiding. We have maybe a dozen memoirs of survivors of these kind of murders. Uh, but probably we should believe them because uh, these are the kind of things precisely where testimonies are the only source we will have. Uh, I want to make a point that for decades, uh, the Ukrainian diaspora and Ukrainian studies in the West relied almost exclusively on testimonies for their case about the famine. Because until the late 1980s, there was no ability to consult the archives. But the same people who accepted the famine testimonies rejected out of hand memoirs of and testimonies of Polish and Jewish victims of Ukrainian nationalists. And this, there's no justifiable reason for this double standard. If we accept testimonies, we have to use them carefully, we have to realize what they say and don't say, then we have to accept them also if they come from, we have to accept them into our consciousness. Perhaps we don't have to say, oh, they're all true. But we have to take them into account when we are studying things. So, uh, and, and when we look at the two kinds of, uh, of, of testimonies, uh, uh, the famine testimonies and the uh, Holocaust testimonies, I have to say that uh, the biggest thing that, that leaps out at a, at a student of, of uh, these killings is that the serious gathering of testimonies on the famine only began in the late 1980s, half a century after what the things that are being described. Uh, while the testimonies of Polish and Jewish victims, uh, particularly of the Hol victims of the Holocaust, were, and not the Polish, the Jewish victims of the Holocaust were collected right after the war. So you get these fresh accounts. Uh, and, um, and even in Holocaust studies, the continued existence of the Soviet Union was a problem. But it was the main reason why you could not get uh, very good testimonies on the famine, because the existence of the Soviet Union, uh, you just simply could not. People did not even know. Uh, uh, that, their, that their parents or grandparents were in, in, uh, in prison. My, my, uh, my wife's cousin, her, grand, her, her uh, mother was, was, uh, spent time in the gulag, and, uh, and her grandson didn't know until, uh, until perestroika that this was the case, that his, his own mother was born in the gulag. He had no idea of this. People kept it quiet. So... Uh, uh, even, though the, even though famine testimonies are collected late, uh, they're often still very fresh because they've never had a chance to uh, express the story before. Um, then I've often consulted earlier testimonies, then later testimonies by the same person. So some people wrote their story three or four times over many decades. And, uh, and, and I, liked, I liked the fresh ones, the earlier ones, because they are absolutely, um, th there's no general story that everybody believes. Today, if there's a Holocaust memoir that comes out, it's very similar. They're all very similar. We all live peacefully and happily until, and then all of a sudden, all hell broke loose. Uh, in those early ones, people weren't sure what to say. They just, they, and the same for the early famine testimonies. They weren't sure of the story yet. There had been no codification of it. There had been no study of it. There had been no popularization in movies. So the people just spoke as they did. But sometimes over the years, uh, some, some scholars find that they get better over the years. I don't have a firm opinion on that. But uh, I, I do think that, that it's worthwhile taking into account all the stages that a person's memory goes through. Uh, another thing I, I, I think about these uh, testimonies is that the famine testimonies tend to be much more politically influenced than the Holocaust testimonies on the whole. Uh, the Holocaust testimonies, they're often 
used, or Holocaust knowledge is used and instrumentalized, which I don't particularly like, to support, let's say, Israeli politics, or to make Israel. But there's no way, it's not easy to make a Holocaust memory or a testimony or memoir support Israel in and of itself. But the famine uh, testimonies were often collected with political purpose. Certainly the Yushchenko uh, uh, testimonies were all collected with a political purpose and were meant to serve a certain uh, tale. The, uh, the uh, testimonies collected in 1953 in the black book of the, uh, the, the black deeds of the Kremlin were also political. They were gathered for a specific purpose to, uh, to feed into uh, um, uh, Cold, War, uh, uh, Cold, Cold War narrative. I mean, it was a true narrative, but it was still a Cold War narrative. Therefore, the emphasis was on Russian uh, uh, colonialism, uh, Russian uh, and Russian communist rule uh, in, in Ukraine. So there, there were always these kind of twists to it. And also I find that there's much more variety in Holocaust testimonies. Um, but that's, that's maybe because the, the, the famine was, was a process that was more universal than, uh, than the particularities of the Holocaust, which went over a, a larger geographical space or something. I'm not sure. And I'm thinking about photographs. And this is a very famous photograph which used to be used in connection with the Ukrainian famine of 32-33. But now we know that it's really from 1921. And that many of the photos which purported to be photos of the Ukrainian famine of 1932-33 were actually photos of the famine of 1921. So uh, that's, that's one point. And then, because the uh, photographs were falsified, uh, this helped all the deniers of the famine uh, who, uh, who, who existed to say, well, the whole thing is just a myth because the photographs are false. So there's this book, Fraud, Famine, and Fascism, the Ukrainian Genocide Myth from Hitler to Harvard, which uh, you know, basically says the famine is nothing more than a fascist kind of fantasy used for the Cold War and didn't really exist. And they use the photographs as an important argument. You can even see on the cover of it that they have the false uh, photograph. The only actual photos we have are very few. They're by an Austrian engineer who was working here in Kharkiv, and there you see a picture. And this is about as close as you get to photos of, of, of the famine. And I contrast that with the immense amount of, uh, uh, immense number of photographs that exist with regard to the Holocaust. I mean, there are more photographs from small towns in Ukraine of the Holocaust in small towns of Ukraine than for the entire Ukrainian famine of 32, 33, genuine photos. They say that the German soldiers, about 10% of them went into war with, with uh, cameras. And going back to the, to the famine photos, it's odd to me that the only photos that exist are by this Austrian engineer. Oh, except the photos of, of uh, there are photos of, uh, of the um, criminal investigations of cannibalism, but I, I don't have any of those and I wouldn't show them if I had them. Uh, but it's odd to me. So, you know, this, this raises a question which I've never seen addressed in, uh, in, uh, in the studies of the famine, which is, you know, what was, did people have cameras? What was photography like as a hobby in the Soviet Union in the 1930s? Why are there no photos? It's a, it's a it's question and, uh, uh, that, that, that really needs to be answered, I think. But on the other hand, this here, this photo here, 
This is of the NKVD murders, which, uh, you know, were, were a pretext for the, for the pogroms. But you see, you see on the back here, it says Bluthof Lemberg, which means like the bloody courtyard or the blood, blood court, blood, blood place Lemberg, Lviv. And uh, what this is was a series of photos that were somebody took, a German soldier took, not an official photographer, and then he made many copies of them, and they were passed around to fellow soldiers or bought and sold like sort of souvenirs. So you have all these kind of things that went around. Uh, and, uh, and this was a fairly common thing in the West, uh, uh, atrocity photos from wars, not just from World War II. And then there were official photographers that the Germans set out to record what they were doing. So this is in Lviv too. This is in, on Bullets uh, Amarstein uh, Yuska. You can see them. You can see them taking pictures of a very serious, very uh, famous series of photos. And then I'm going to go over the next photo. I'm going to go very quickly because I don't really want to show it, but I have to show it in order to talk about it. So I'm just going to go through it real quickly. And, uh, and then there, there's these photos, these color photos from Babinyar, very famous. Piles of clothing from, from the ravine in Babinyar. And, and these photos could be used, so when I was try, trying to uh, work out the uh, course of the uh, Le Vieux Pogrom and the role of the militia, uh, fo fo photographs were one more piece of evidence which I could use because they show militia men uh, uh, involved in the arrest of uh, Jews on the street or the beating of a Jewish woman in a prison or uh, in Brigitte. It's not very clear, I guess. Maybe I'll get this cursor. Can you see the cursor? So this guy is a militia man. And uh, this is a film. There's also films of the, of the Holocaust. Yeah. So... One of the things I want to say is that, again, just like in the case of the famine and the, and the, and the Holocaust, one had very delayed collection of memoirs and very late. One thing being that much of it is told from the perspective of children. But for the Holocaust, we have this other thing. So too, we have all these photographs that help us understand what went on uh, during the Holocaust and very little photographic material of any help to us in understand the personal experience of, of the famine. Maybe hunger is not as photogenic as, 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 as violence. Uh, and, and, and it's not only numbers, it's, it's even the kind of films. Color films of the Holocaust, color, color stills, films, etc. Then I showed very quickly uh, but, but it's important to talk about it. This sort of pornographic violence. You saw the, the naked women which were there. Well, that's what interested those photographers and interested the perpetrators. And in general, one valuable thing about the photographs that the Germans took is that it makes very clear the perpetrator's viewpoint of things, how they looked at it, how they saw it. Because these photos, if you try to imagine, we don't have them. We don't really have, we don't have photographs from the point of view of victims, of course. But what would these same scenes look like if they were taken by the victims? I and mean, this is an important question to ask yourself. What would they look like? They would look very different. They'd look like this, or they'd look like, you know. And, um, and I'm going to come back to this point because it's an important one. But um, very often, people in the name of historical realism reproduce these perpetrators' photos. Uh, the paper that talked about it in the case of, uh, of, of, of those two works of literature by Zabushko and Vinachuk. But in film, I don't know how many of you saw the film about the... Uh, Holocaust in Lviv called uh, Vciemnosti, in the darkness. It was a Polish film about uh, 
about some Jews who survived in the, um, in the sewers of Lviv. Well, one thing they do at the beginning of the film is they show uh, various scenes of naked women running and, uh, and other things that are copies that are meant to, to, to re-dramatize the same pictures that we saw from the point of view of the perpetrators. When we do that, and uh, also Korchak, uh, the film Korchak does that too. It uses real footage of the, and, and Spielberg does it too. They use German footage of what they did during the Holocaust, and they base then their recreation in the film of it. It's a problem with that. The problem is that we are again seeing it through the eyes of the perpetrator. It doesn't make it more realistic, really. It makes it more... Um, It actually helps us see things from the point of view of the criminals in this, in this thing. So, we have to be real careful with, with these photographs. We have to be really, I think, um, sensitive to who takes them and why they take them and what their interests are. They like atrocity photos. They like sex photos. And uh, as I say, pictures from pogroms compared pictures from the pogrom compared with testimonies. Uh, it's a very interesting exercise to see what, what, is, what is documented in one kind of source and what is the other. I did it for, for, for one memoir, but it could be done more. Uh, and you can use it for proof. So I use it as an additional proof of the role of the Owen militia in the uh, pogroms. And then I'm going to talk about documents. And here I have in mind perpetrator documents. Uh, and of course, there's a wide range of documents. But one of the points I, one of the starting points and the impetus is for, for this kind of uh, 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 remarks I'm going to make is that there are some historians who believe you can only use the documents, that testimonies don't count, photographs don't count, only documents. What the perpetrator says he did, that's what we're to believe. Can you imagine that in the judicial system? I mean, thank God history and, and law are different. But in history, we can't just take a document at face value and say, oh yes, well this is what happened because they said so. And there's an interesting, uh, interesting sort of uh, family history or, uh, of, 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 of this kind of attitude. Anyway, so we're probably uh, this, is, this is an interesting document, and it's a typical of the kind of documents that are brought to bear to prove the famine. So, uh, in this one, uh, uh, they're talking about um, that there's not enough food in the hospital, that people are dying in the hospital, that they're not getting what they need, and it's signed by the head uh, physician in the hospital. And this proves that there's a famine and, and shows how great it was. You know, uh, uh, the whole hospital's work can be over, overthrown if we don't get some food soon. And uh, this is, a, I, put a, I picked a Ukrainian uh, uh, language document, but the German documents are much like, this is a, uh, the, the Ukrainian police, they're talking about uh, uh, their arrest uh, during the actions. This is from the 30th of March, 1942, an action in Lviv. And they're just saying how many, they, how many Jews they arrested. And, uh, and referring to it, Volodymyr was talking about two. In this one, there's 32 Ukrainian policemen, 14 German policemen. And this is already when they're not... Uh, when they're not uh, 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 working with the Jewish uh, police. So, this is an interesting difference. Germans, they were very interested in doing what they were doing. They did want to exterminate the Jews. They made no real secret of it, certainly not among themselves. They described it in explicit terms. Many documents, if you want to know the number of Jews killed in Babi Yar in the end of September 41. 
you can find a German document that very clearly says we killed 33,000 some Jews. I mean, probably the number is off, but you know, they, they gave an estimate of what they did. They um, regularly reported, the Einsatzgruppen regularly reported, the police reported, Ukrainian police reported, the order police reported. We can reconstruct the whole thing. And, um, and, and it's a very strong temptation to use them as our main and, and sometimes only source. With the whole demor, with the famine, it's very different. You don't have uh, the kind of reports that say, well, we must kill Ukrainians. We must starve them to death. That's implied by some state decisions. Uh, Certainly the kind of language used and caricatures used of the kulaks or kurkuli, very similar to anti-Jewish propaganda. I don't know if you've ever seen the kind of uh, uh, posters that the uh, Soviets put out about the kulaks. They were tr treated, called vermin and, and rec, you know, they were uh, described in much the same way as Jews were described. But overall, the kind of documents that prove the famine are things where people are trying to fix the results of the famine. So the head doctor in the hospital says, we don't have enough food. We need more food or everybody's going to die. Uh, orphanages, we don't have any space. There's too many children being left here. Um, we don't have enough food to feed our, our uh, orphanages. Uh, you, can find the, you can find the results of... Uh, uh, efforts to combat the typhus epidemic which accompanied the famine. So most of the documents that prove that there was a famine are actually the documents that are trying to correct or uh, ameliorate uh, the effects of the famine. And it would look from those documents as though the Soviet state, or at least the people who were functioning in the institutions, were, uh, were opposed to this policy. And, th and that might have been the case, that they may have been opposed to the policy. But that doesn't nonetheless mean that there wasn't a mass killing that resulted in the death of four million people as a result of state things. So one kind of mass killing produces one kind of document, which is, looks totally different than another kind of document. And that has to be taken into account as well when, when one works with these, with these things. Uh, but there's a problem with reliance on documents for the study of the Holocaust. And here the major influence is Raoul Hilberg's destruction of the European Jews. Everybody who's in this business of Holocaust studies has to read that book. It's a long book. It's a very important book. It gives you the idea of the uh, uh, murder. But it relies solely and entirely on German documents. It does not take into account testimonies. It does not really use photographic evidence. It relies only on what the perpetrators themselves say. And Hilberg, he felt that that was enough, that if I say what the Germans say, uh, they made no secrets, which I point I, I made as well. Therefore, we can get the whole story by finding out what they had to say. And this had an influence on Holocaust studies. It's one of the reasons why we have so few studies of the Ukrainian Holocaust, by the way. I would, I'm going to argue that in, a, in an upcoming uh, thing I'm writing. Anyways, and it had an influence on all the major works of the Holocaust for a very long time. You take a look at a book this classic is Christopher Browning's Ordinary Men. I don't know if you've read that one, but it's about a reserve police battalion which had been a reserve police battalion in Hamburg and then all of a sudden was assigned to occupied Poland and they had to kill people. That was their business, either shooting them themselves or conveying them to, uh, to uh, the death camps, rounding up Jews. Well... This book relies entirely on German documents and German trials and what the perpetrators had to say about themselves. It's a very careful analysis. So Christopher Browning, uh, 
tries to look at why people, how did they do it? What was the peer pressure? Did some people enjoy it? Were they sadists? Or were they just really just ordinary people put in evil circumstances? So he's looking at every little thing that these Germans do and trying to figure out what their motivations were, what their souls were like. But at one point in the book, he has heavies come in. You know, heavies, heavies are, um, are like Ukrainians and um, local people of the, of the occupied Soviet Union who are collaborators and have to help with murders and things like that. So he has heavies come in, and they commit horrible crimes. They get totally drunk, and they kill people. He doesn't spare even a moment to try to figure out whether they, what they had motivations. I mean, these are just sort of, you know, Unter mention come and getting drunk and killing people. Orientalism. Because that's certainly the way the Germans looked at it. In this book, which details the uh, massacres committed by one police ordinary, or, order police battalion in, in uh, Poland, uh, there's not a single testimony that he uses from anybody in these localities. So all his entire story comes from, uh, comes from the Germans and what the Germans have to say. And Dieter Paul, uh, who also wrote an excellent book, and, and by the way, Christopher Browning's book is an excellent book. It is an excellent book. We all, somebody said, was, was, it, was it you, Alexander, who said we all bring our subject, subjectivities to this? Or somebody said it was, a, it was absolutely brilliant. Anyways, there's no objective history. It's true. So all these great works also have their flaws. Dieter Paul wrote a book on the, on the Holocaust in Galicia, which also relied entirely on German documents uh, and consulted no, uh, no uh, Holocaust testimony at all. Yeah, hard to believe. And that's why and there's several things happen as a result of that. Uh, one was an underestimation of Jewish resistance. Because if you rely on what the Germans say, they're always, uh, they only take into account Jewish resistance when it's a real threat. So the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising is well described. But all the little incidents that occur are missed. The only way you can get to the extent of Jewish resistance is to go to testimonies and memoirs. It's the only source that, that gives you that. Because the Germans were not recording that kind of thing. Uh, and, uh, and, it, and, and this was one of the points that, uh, you know, that Hilberg tried to get his book published by Yad Vashem in Israel. And uh, Yad Vashem wouldn't publish it. And one of the reasons, they said, was that he hadn't consulted eyewitness testimony and that he didn't know the languages of the places where he was working. And this became part of it. People wrote about, uh, about Poland all the time. They didn't know Polish. Anyways, underestimation of rescue efforts on the part of the non-Jewish population. According to Hilberg, there's hardly any rescue efforts. But if you read the testimonies, you'll see at all times that people are getting hidden here, fed there, you know, people are, people are helping them quite a bit. But it was very hard in the conditions of the Nazi occupation to mount a large Jewish resistance or to mount large rescue efforts. Even Szeptycki, the famous rescuer of, of Jews, maybe saved 150 people. 1.5 million Jews were killed on the territory of what's today Ukraine, including Crimea. So uh, that was the problem with uh, 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 under, of, of relying on the German sources. Inadequate and inexact information on local collaborators. And just the Germans really were very little interested in the internal workings, except when it was a threat. So the, the Bandera group appears in, in German documents, and they appear as collaborators up to a point, and then they all of a sudden become the enemies, but no real understanding of the internal, uh, internal thing or, or, the, the, or uh, any single out, singling out of political motivation for local collaborators. 
And the most important thing, of course, is the total neglect of victims' experiences. This is missing from all these works because they rely entirely on documents. And that's why we have to, we have to bring back into our uh, work the testimonies. So what have we uh, uh, discovered? Well, what have we discovered? Well, what, the different genocides can produce very different kinds of documentation. And the historian has to be sensitive to this, absolutely. And we have to understand that the documentation is formed by the specificity of the mass killing events. Each one is different. And that the sources flow out of the kind of ways that this murder is being conducted. And, and I guess we have to also realize that you have to make, you have to triangulate these various sources. You have to use the documents of various kinds and then we try to create the story out of those documents. So those, that is what I was going to say. I don't know what the time is, but I suppose I've talked about half an hour. Okay, so thank you. Thank you so much, and maybe somebody has some questions, comments here. Oh, no, please. Sorry, just to, to add something to it. I mean, I have too many comments, so I won't make them. Uh, just one, uh, but uh, you mentioned something very important about the transformation of memory, that when we take the testimony of someone right after the war, and then some, let's say, in the 60s, sometimes once again in the 1990s, and uh, John Paul and I, too, uh, prefer to stick with the 1940s and rather than the 1990s. But it's very interesting to see the transformation. And I have uh, this uh, published last year in English, a diary, a diary of a young 12-year-old girl who survived in Poland in, in hiding. And she was victim of sexual violence. She was raped on a daily basis by her host, who was saving her at the same time. She survived while being raped throughout the war. And uh, then she went on and she came to Canada and she provided a testimony for her grandchildren in 1970, which of course eliminates the whole part. She didn't of course want to talk about the bad parts. And even more so, she, or she, she arranged for her savior slash rapist the Medal of Righteous Among the Nations, which he received. Um, and so this kind of transformation of memory is something very, very fascinating. And this is just a little comment I wanted to share. Yeah, but what you see also, also that particular kind of case where uh, in the old country you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't at all mention rape because until there's a discussion of that... And I agree. I agree with you know, from day to day, in hiding. That's why I think that value of this testimony. Uh-huh. But I was going to say that um, uh, depending on the circumstances, one, one can speak about things that were formerly unspeakable. Right. Which is the case now. You, 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 can, you can talk about these things uh, more openly. Okay. Yes, but I would like to speak Russian. Yes, but I would like to speak Russian. Maybe some comments, if I may. Yeah. Um, actually, I have serious hand now, and I would not divide such way. Uh, maybe it should, maybe not. Um, Holdemar and uh, Holocaust testimonies, because in some collections which you mentioned here, for instance, Shaw Foundation collections, Uber Foundation, Uber Foundation. Um, uh, this is uh, actually uh, where we introduce. Yeah, so it's people. Jewish, mostly Jewish, but also some Gentiles, uh, mostly the writers of the nations. Um, they speak about their life, and it's possible, actually, in this interview, there's a lot of information about Holdover as well, in some interviews. Some yes, more, I've, some I've less. seen it. Yes, so it, it's, 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 this interview is also relevant, I say, for reconstruction of history of the Holdover as well, so it's this way. And also about this interview from Osteredok. Actually, and you wrote one article about one specific collection, which was called um, Collection Aspohade, 
Yeah, yeah. Con uh, con yeah, and you actually mentioned what, how it's possible the Holocaust was described in this system. It's another way is why and how it's another one, but also it's possible to find out some information there as well. So it's, it's for me, it's a question, <laughs> is it possible to divide it also? A lot of another archives, collections, stores of uh, testimonies. For instance, Bethlehem Ghetto. It's a ghetto fighter house, I think. So it's uh, in it's a right small one archive, but it's also very useful, I think, so for um, history of the Holocaust, and I think maybe for Voldemort as well. So my question is: should be no some brief question about um, um, about the Hat and Num testimonies or interviews? How do you think? Is it actually relevant to you them? For uh, reconstruction of uh, history of 1940 years and uh, to, to do it, or it's more, I have to say, to, to write about memory, about actually how people now, um, using their experience, reconstruct their his, his history. It's many, 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 many decades after the war and the Holocaust, and so how would you think about this? Well, um First of all, I, I have to say it, I have to agree that there are, pro there are problems with memory uh, that, that enters into this. There's a very famous uh, German sociological study, uh, Op Opa war kein Nazi, right? My grandfather was no Nazi, in which they show, um, they show how three generations of Germans interpret the same story uh, and many times people remember films you know they they saw a film about something and it turns out that, that when they tell their story that they're actually telling the plot of a movie that they had seen not because they're lying it's just because uh, that's what happens so yeah there is this problem that that memory is um, can be can betray the truth uh, but uh, sometimes we have no access uh, to um, events unless we go to people's memories. So I, I consider them a pretty important source. I would say it also depends on the kind of question you're, you're dealing with. Um, if you're very interested in the actual implements of destruction, say gas vans, uh, uh, you know, gas showers, uh, guns, and so forth, then yes, then probably the perpetrator's documents are the most important source. But if you're trying to uh, get to the more human aspects of things, then you really have to go into their memoirs. And, uh, and, um, and, and, and court trials can be useful in that, that sense, too. They're very much like memoirs. So, and then you made the point about not necessarily dividing these, because sometimes they, you know, that's true that in the Shoah, I've often told this to my friends who are doing Holodomor studies, that the Shoah Foundation videos have lots of information on the famine, uh, and they're unique in that sense because a lot, of the, a lot of the memoirs come from Western Ukraine, where there was no famine, or from Poland, where there was no famine. But the Shoah uh, encompassed a, 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 lot, a, a lot of testimonies from people from, from, from the whole of Ukraine. And they talk quite a bit about it. They talk about the, uh, uh, the famine. They were, they were not as touched by the famine as, let's say, rural Ukrainians generally were. But there's a lot of information. I've often told people you should go and look at those things. So, uh, and and it's true that the Sadatic one as well. That they both are both 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 are there. But the actual gathering of testimonies for a specific purpose uh, has gone on most of the time. So the the uh, the collection of Holocaust memories only as a byproduct has family. Якщо можна, одне таке питання, я задав українською. Ви, в принципі, говорили про два сюжети, які описуються як геноциди і пов'язані з українською землею. Так, Голодобор і Голокост. Це трохи таке питання, актуалізоване політикою. 
але ви, мабуть, знаєте, що і депортація народів Криму, кримських татар особливо, вона описується зараз як геноцид. А чи вважаєте ви, що тут є певні науковий потенціал, і в подальшому цей сюжет може розроблятись дослідниками саме як геноцид? Депортація кримських татар. Ну, я думаю, що це належить до, 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 до того самого виду явищ. Що це депортація і, і кримських татар, і також депортації в, в Литві і, і в Латвії. Я, я вживаю слово геноцид, але не в точному значенні, тому що це є дуже політизований термін. Як читати, як читати дефініцію значення в, в, в документах ООН, то, то дуже багато можна включити слово геноцид. Але звичайно люди думають, що якщо то не Голокост, то не геноцид. І я, я, тому я справді я, я, я уникаю, я, я, я втікаю від, від тої термінології. Але я думаю, що на жаль, українська територія є дуже, дуже добра лабораторія порівняльних студій геноциду. Розкоркулення, депортації різні, counterinsurgency, як придушували повстання на Західній Україні. То є дуже багато таких. І, і знаєте, хто, хто веде вперед в тій проблематиці? Це якраз ті жіночі історики, які беруть різні моменти травми і, і обговорять їх, як, вони, як це відбилося на, на, на ситуацію і на, і на тіла жінок. Так що вони бачили скорше всього, я думаю, ті споріднені. Моменти. Але, але треба вважати на, на них, я думаю. Я просто хочу додати, що ми не повинні писати в цьому світі без свідчення. І ви абсолютно правильні. Ви можете сказати, що Браунін написав, all of a sudden brought full force testimonies back in the Holocaust studies and more than the Germans in the Holocaust studies. Saul Friedlander was doing the same kind of same thing. Friedlander. Ah, Saul Friedlander too. Yeah, to me, to me it was Gross's book. I think that was before. And, and for East European studies that was, that was quite important. And it, it led, I think, to Dieter Paul then became interested, he said, We have, to, we have to work on the pogroms, and for that we have to take in victims. So people, there's been a shift in the field, and it's a, and it's a good shift. And you, you young people are already doing it, so I'm, I suppose I'm, I'm telling you what, what I've discovered after a long time, and you discovered right from birth. Okay. Okay? Any questions? Дуже. Ну що, дуже пані, дякуємо. Дякую.